thank you all for attending this exceptional uh, DGC webinar about uh, circular design building uh, in the art department featuring two amazing production teams, Suits and Endlings. First order of business. Suits and Endlings. Premièrement, veuillez sélectionner. Uh, by pressing the globe at the bottom of your screen. Pour nos collègues uh, du Québec ou dans le reste de la francophonie canadienne, uh, s'il vous plaît, sélectionnez uh, le français en cliquant le globe en bas de l'écran. I am Natalie Anne Broussard, uh, DGC Senior Staff, and I'm welcoming you to this very special uh, event. Now, please join me in a land acknowledgement. I would like to first acknowledge the traditional indigenous and lands uh, that we all live and gather on today. Although this meeting is online and our event takes place at many locations across Canada, we each enjoy the pleasure. Au Canada, nous avons tous le plaisir de vivre et de travailler sur un territoire. Signe de reconnaissance pour l'utilisation que nous faisons de leur terre. As a recognition for the use that we're making of their lands. Um, sorry. As a recognition for the use that we are making of their lands, I would invite each and every one of us to have a positive thought for the Indigenous lands and to nourish the hope for their health and their well-being during this period of uncertainty. Now let me go through some quick housekeeping rules. So as I said, there's simultaneous translation being offered. Just click on the globe. Uh, please mute your audio and enter your full name uh, to participate. Uh, also, uh, we have a chat function, so please keep it up for the entire duration. And if you have questions, please put them in a Q&A. Pour les questions en français, s'il vous plaît, les inscrire. Uh, Any dans... French question, put them in the Q&A, and we'll be happy to be able to answer them in French. Uh, Marianne Wickham, uh, our DGC National Caucus Rep, for the art department. Marion is a multi-award winning production designer who for over 30 years has enjoyed working across Canada as well as New York, Poland, and South Africa. She is passionate about designing unique and independent stories with recent features including Agam Darshi's Donkey Head, Rob Adetouye's period uh, musical Stan, a, a Canadian Screen Award 2020 uh, nominee for best production uh, design. Tammy Al's Always uh, Dying featured Felicity Hoffman, which uh, premiered at TIFF uh, 2019. The Marijuana Conspiracy, uh, which premiered at Whistler 2019 as well. Né élevé en Saskatchewan et formé en théâtre. From Saskatchewan and trained in theater, she studied painting and art history in Florence. She holds a master's in interdisciplinary art, media, and design. Marion continues designing for the stage, occasionally on top of designing artistic installations at large scale. Thank you so much. And I pass on the virtual mic to you. Thank you, Natalie Ann, for that introduction and for the whole staff that you have working behind the scenes here. It's quite incredible. And uh, I'd also like to thank the panelists uh, for so generously contributing so much of their time and expertise in preparation for this webinar. So the whole team has, has really brought something together wonderfully. And this is it's very exciting to be part of this inaugural art department focused sustainability webinar. So regarding the subject, circular design build. Design build, most of you probably know what that means, um, but why and what is the circular all about? So taking back to the root of that that word circular economy is a concept and a term that's been floated since the late 1980s and it's become a dominant term and a dominant concept for the whole sustainability action so the prominent and very influential ellen macarthur foundation which is based in the uk has this to say by way of definition so jack if you want to bring up the card with the definition then people can all see it oh there it is okay so in a circular economy and nothing becomes waste and everything has value a circular economy increasingly built on renewable energy and materials is distributed diverse and inclusive so we all know that those are very important uh, concepts uh, today so the big question is, what does it take to change the social, environmental, and economic model from a linear to a circular economy? And what can you do to help bring about this change? 
So let's just show the graphic just to helps illustrate it. We're our visual audience after all. So as, across the top, you can see that um, there's um, you know there's materials and then it turns into something and production and and consumption distribution, and then it goes into waste. Whereas in a circular economy, which is the lower lower image, um, you have materials it turns into production and distribution and it's utilized, but then it keeps going back in the circle. So those ingredients and those elements and those materials enter back into the system and very little goes to waste or uh, adding to the carbon footprint. So the good news is that studios and broadcasters and producers in our industry are making it a priority to embrace sustainability and reduce their carbon footprint. The National DGC will be launching a climate action sustainability uh, this uh, website or something similar this fall. And most of the unions and industry organizations are getting on board also, meaning that you'll find support as you try to be sustainable in your job in the industry. Also, the federal government has just committed $5 billion towards the Green Shift Program at Canadian Heritage and Culture. So that's also a really good sign. So you might be a production designer looking to engage your team on a climate action and foster a spirit of collaboration, or you might be a PA just looking to do your part. So no matter what your role is on a production, you do have a role to play in climate action. So embrace it. In this webinar, the intent is not to be uh, prescriptive nor didactic. This isn't a course. There's no quiz at the end. Um, yet we will focus on ways uh, within the design build crafts that we can relatively easily, and I want to underscore that word easily, embrace and enact greater sustainability. So in essence, we want to activate and normalize a circular economy within our own film ecosystem. As an addendum to today's webinar, in the chat, we are providing uh, links to a wide range of informative resources. And I tell you, there's a ton out there. There's so much good work being done. So this includes um, the Green Production Guide and their Peach Toolkit, which came out of the United States, a highly developed uh, resource tool. They also have a carbon tracker as part of their uh, toolkit. Um, Ecosino is a uh, company in Montreal that has developed various strategies, and they have a circular design workshop. There's a link there and also a case study videos of the feature film 1917 and the television series Magicians, which were two large scale productions that really embrace sustainability. So these are really uh, two short, very inspiring clips that you can watch that are just are, are kind of just exciting and very affirming, as I said. So please check out the links. The case studies uh, chosen to help illustrate the circular design build flow were selected for two primary reasons. Number one, these highly successful productions represent two quite contrasting styles. Suits is realistic and stylishly contemporary, whereas Endlings is organic and more loosely imaginative. Number two, the teams who designed and built each of these diversely realized series were driven by factors of time and budget, as we all are. Um, but they also embraced very intentional and effective strategies that manifest as key actions within the circular design build flow. So there's a lot of overlap between time, budget savings, and circular design build flow. And you might already be aware of this. And in fact, you might already be doing a lot of it. So the next thing is to shift your process into a very conscientious, sustainable strategy and normalize it within our industry. So during our initial talks for this webinar, our panelists and I reviewed a draft of the art department top 10 here's how list. Um, and this will be launched as part of that DGC sustainability initiative later on in the fall. It's a list that amplifies and outlines 10 easy tactics and strategies that you and your design build colleagues can employ in an effort to be as sustainable as possible. So with today's circular design build topic in mind, the panel's conversation will focus primarily on point number two of the top 10, here's how. So um, Jack, if you could just show us that card. Is it up already? Yeah, here it is. Um, so just drilling down on it, it's number two, think reusable, think modular, think circular, um, and uh, design. So design modular sets for uh, deconstruction, disassembly, and material reuse. Design and build sets with recycled, refurbished, and retrofitted set elements and materials that can be harvested and reused again. Design and build using sustainable materials with the, the main goal being to reduce their carbon waste and create zero landfill. So as part of the conversation, both creative cases and business cases will be made uh, by our two design teams. Um, as they tell you about their circular design build process and the tactics they use to actually achieve high level aesthetics that were also cost effective and sustainable as possible. 
So let's get the conversation started and note that I will be posting essentially the same uh, question prompts to both panels to help accentuate that two very diverse designs can actually still use this process. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Team Suits. Are your pictures up there? Hi guys. And we still need. Uh, hello. We still need the diesel. Yep. Diesel come out. Okay. So we have DGC production designer Clive Thomason. He started his career working on David Cronenberg's The Fly 35 years ago, and has a very uh, resume working as a carpenter, set decorator, and production designer on features, MOWs, and TV series, including nine seasons of NBC Suits. Clive has worked in Canada, China, Hungary, France, and South Africa, and thrives on the challenges of working overseas. And hopefully, you'll get that chance again soon. Peter Joe Madziak. And Joe, Joe has Matiak. been a construction coordinator in the film and TV industry for about 30 years. Before that, he was involved in theater, and to this day, he still enjoys being pulled into a theater project, and I know this for a fact. Joe loves series work as it demands full collaboration of everyone in the art department, and it's this collaboration that he feels will be so valuable as we work together to achieve more sustainable circularity in our industry. And finally, we have IATSE set decorator Liesl Delorier, who was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and has been creating imaginative spaces for as long as she can recall. Initially recruited to assist on many independent projects in props, greens, wardrobe, AD, and even as a boom operator, she started working as a key set decorator in 1998, yet highly values the varied experiences she has had to, to gain a wider and deeper perspective of the entire filmmaking process. So let's move on to, um, I just want to give a little preface about Suits, which ran for nine seasons and was very successful. And as on most series, at some point, uh, for purposes of time and budget, one starts finding ways to utilize all the elements. So, yeah, um, Jacopo, can we show the end of the first set? So, I understand from the previous conversation we had that you actually made six sets out of the same set of elements. We're just showing four of them here for just so that they're clearer on the screen. But can you talk about what your process was for designing and building all of these sets out of a singular set of elements? and how it kind of ties into the circular design build flow with you know the deconstruction disassembly material reuse recycling etc can you talk about that clive would you like to start sure. us off so so basically the these four photographs represent uh, it wasn't i mean there were, there were more than six of them it was you know because we got scripts at such late dates on the show we never really knew what we were going to get so we sometimes had to conjure something up out of a blank blank slate and produce um, something out of uh, areas which were already built, had windows in them, walls and ceilings and things like this, and then had to drastically, you know, within maybe a week or two weeks, change it into a completely different environment. So these four photographs basically uh, contain, they're, they're contained in the, in the same uh, space, same uh, footprint of, of the floor. And we did things, you know, like um, moving window. We had lots of, uh, ten, well, the, basically the ceilings were 10 foot. So we had 10 foot windows in here and we would move these around, uh, change the, the frames for them, change the colors of the frames, change the flooring. Um, so everything had to be done, uh, not only in a, in a very uh, time efficient manner, but um, also budget wise. So. By the time we'd done this for a few seasons, we end, we, we got very good at it, and we had a, you know a large supply of, of things like um, carpet tile flooring, click flooring, because um, flooring is always a big issue because it you know because of our time constraints that it, it had to be pretty much instantaneous. You know, so, you know, so we could be you know having to lay three thousand square foot of flooring in in a day. So now we're not only is it something which we're going to recycle each time around. It has to be done quickly and expediently. So, and what kind of lead time would you have to actually design these? And, and what was the time frame over which these four? Well, so, um, uh, the time frame it, it was uh, between each episode, so it could be seven days, seven ten days. So it was it was you know. And what was it, I remember talking to you and Joe in one of our early conversations. Well, three of you, and yet you designed you, you described a fairly 
organic sort of almost from the hip <laughs> design process walking from the from the what the storage where all the stuff was stored to this just, just want to talk us through how that came about because sometimes we know we don't have time to do a full out design right that's correct and, and um Sometimes the design, you know, had to lend to, the, to uh, you know, what Liesl had on hand in terms of furniture, because we knew that she couldn't, you know, order furniture and get, get stuff or we couldn't build it. I mean, initially, we, at the beginning of each season, though, we always had um, a pre-production of maybe two, three months, and we knew that there was going to be a big standing set. So that, that was, you know, that was normal. But, but over time, as each season progressed, we realized, A, because of, of the way the scripts were written and how late they came to us, we never really knew what were going to be in them. So now we had to almost stockpile. We never threw anything out. We never, we stored absolutely every every flat that, that was ever built on the show for, for years and years. So we where, did you, where did you store all this stuff? Like, um, all we, we shot this up at Downview in, in Toronto, which was an old um, munitions, storage warehouse and it was allowed to, NBC basically rented this this place out on a on a continuous basis and there was a lot of space for storage we were lucky because most productions never ever get that mm -hmm. as a you know it's it's a I mean it kind of drove Joe nuts because he had to keep track of it all and um but I, like Clive um we did we found it was interesting we found little nooks and crannies uh uh to, to hide stuff and then and Clive and I kind of knew where everything was. And that's where I think uh, Marion's uh, alluding to the fact that sometimes on the way from your office, the art department, on our way to where we were going to build, you and I would stop along the way and we could start to almost design saying, okay, we're gonna pull these windows from here. We're gonna use these certain flats from here. Uh, we'll paint this, we'll do that. And so we'd start to get an organic feel often and the designer would be with us and walking along and then uh, she could draw to to sort of what we were pulling right that's um, correct I mean, I mean a lot of times we, we it's not that we didn't draw the sets but we basically yeah. drew the sets as we saw elements that we were going to reuse and, and move around and mm -hmm. things like this and then and then we would you know design the set around that so, and of course all of these all of these interiors they're all pretty much modern day which made it easier um, what's coming up in the next production is, is something completely different. And, uh, you know, well, I think that's why this is so valuable because, you know, so many of the series being done like, are contemporary or they're like some, perhaps science fiction or something, but I think this is, you just created such a valuable flow here. And, and, and I was, uh, Liesl, if you want to talk about some of the things that you did with the elements that were perhaps sure. one thing, and then you transitioned into other things and it's quite great too. Yeah, well, what, one thing that I remember is on so many of those walks, um, Clive would call me and say, you got to come join us because he wanted me to be aware of what they were planning right from the beginning, because as time became an issue, having a buyer run around and money, obviously, I started thinking about walls a lot, like the wall coverings. And, uh, you know, we talked about Clive's use of fabric. Um, fabric panels that could be interchanged and used differently. And I started also thinking about using fabric as art and finding different prints that we could use as art. And we did actually take wall panels and use reuse the fabric for art in, in some cases as well. Um, and in these, I can see almost all of these pieces were generated by a very talented scenic department um, with references that I would want to use for style, but we painted over these canvases, which got us in trouble a few times because we had to go back. So we had to recreate them, which was, I guess, kind of fun for the artists, but, or maybe not so much fun. But I think, you know, from the get-go, uh, Clive would let me know, Joe would let me know what's happening. We talk about the teams working because carpet tile, my set deck team became so good at carpet tiling because they would have to redo a huge area sometimes. And I remember, we would get notice from the ADs that they're moving on and we'd go right in there and start ripping up carpet tile and Joe would be right in there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the turnaround was that quick. So I think it's really important that you're all aware of the goal. And if our goal is circular design, we have to all be aware of that from the get go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from, uh, so, so from these four pictures here, we, we, we could turn around, say number, number one picture down to, to the one below it, we could turn that around probably in three and four days. 
you know, painting, moving walls, repaneling. You know, we had panels from from different sets sitting around. We could reverse them and have wood like a wood veneer on the back of it and paint on the other side of it. And we could just attach those to the walls. And, you know, so we got really good at, at doing this. And the sets and were obviously right. saved a fortune in terms of, you know, everything not going to, to um, you know, to the dump. Like it was, you know. And your flats were primarily 10 feet. You said the sets were 10 feet here. The, the ceiling was a 10 foot height. So it was because of the windows and the window mullions, it was, it was an easy thing to just move. I mean, they were heavy, but we could move those around and reconfigure you know, office spaces and, and we had two sets of window mullions. So we had like a dark set, a, a almost black set and a silver set. So we could just re reuse the glass each time around and it would be a completely different looking set. Mm -hmm. Mary, and I have to say there are times when people were lost, like the crew would come back and not know where they were or <laughs> we put a wall that wasn't there. Uh, we were always really careful because we used a lot of glass. Obviously, Joe and, and uh, Clive, you know, had so much glass and steel in, in their design. So. Um, yeah, people would be, what, where, this was, wasn't this something else yesterday? And it was confusing. Let's just go back to the fabric thing. So like some, like, you can't see it because these photographs are, you have to be made smaller, but like, for example, are the, is it like, was it stapled? And then you just took the fabric off and- That's correct. Yeah, so so we, 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 Lisa would get bolts of different colors of um, different textures of fabric. And we were just opposed to, you know, like a, a four by 10 flat. And then just you know pass them together, and you could have you could either you could either have it painted on the back of it. So if you needed a, a different set behind, it was easy to do, or, or you could just recover the paint. Mm -hmm. So it was almost an instant. You know, painting and plastering took you know days, and all of a sudden we're now changing. I mean, it, and it was only because it was a modern day set. It was easier to do, obviously, than you know if you were doing a, a grungy basement. It's not so easy to do that. So yeah, but there's probably a, we'd probably figure that out too. <laughs> I guess <laughs> figure that out too. But so going back to the like the uh, so Liesl, you made you, you sometimes made artwork out of the fabric, but I, I heard you in there, yeah, upholstery and cushions and stuff. Yeah, seeing the fertility clinic slide, those two pieces that diptych right there, I recognize that fabric, and I think I just thought it looked modern, I like the colors of it for the set, but. From a distance, it looked like birds on a wire. You know, you see a whole bunch lining up, and I just like the idea of fertility. And I just think it's a great bolt of fabric. And uh, yeah, there we use it as art. But sometimes you use the actual wall fabric. I understand as artwork and as cushion fabric and all that kind of stuff. That's so right, and it the same thing because it was such a good fabric. It was a good texture because sometimes it didn't have to necessarily have a pattern on it, but the texture mm -hmm. was great, and it was just you know nice neutral colors. So I could mix it in anywhere. Um, and use it to reupholster just two things. Yeah. And, uh, and we, uh, uh, of course, we had to be kind of careful about because of clearances of, of fabric designs, which is, is way, way less difficult than if you're using art and you need to clear it instantly. That, that is a, bit, a whole other question, isn't it? A whole other, yeah. Wallpaper, all that stuff. It's like, yeah. like why should, anyway, that's another conversation. Yeah. <laughs> it has fabric that we did have to clear. We had a couple. Really? Yeah. We did that wow. um, I just also want to add to that along the same thing is you can well imagine after uh, so many seasons of doing offices, Liesl was running out of uh, office desks in the city, like the original trying to get a difference in desks. So she came to us with the idea of what about some laminates that we could you know quickly cover uh, or uh, and you know reuse different laminates for certain desks. And so we had quite a system there that uh, by pulling different, right, Liesl, like pulling different laminates or again, maybe wonderful. even fabric. Yeah, you had and they could me. totally change some of those power desks, desks that uh, the executives were using. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. You could use them back to back, but with the different uh, laminates or, or, or fabric on them, it's a total different look. And sometimes not even just the surface. Sometimes we'd have, um, say, a return that had a lower shelf. And then we put a laminate in that area as well. And you guys started managing to get it to stay on the sides, even on the angle desk. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we laminate the sides as well. And then of course you put glass on top of it and it's a whole different look again. So Joe would give me a little piece of glass and we would hold it over the laminate so we could see how different it looked. And then we, Clyde wanted to underpaint the glass. So we did that and we tried that experiment as well. So yeah, we just kept changing it. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, it's fantastic because actually, and these are only four, you made, there was six sets altogether that you made out of the same elements you told me, so. Yes. 
fantastic. We, all, we also built a, a lot of kitchens on the show. And so, you know, we got really good at shopping at Ikea, uh, <laughs> buying buying carcasses from Ikea and then just facing the, the, you know, if you needed a different look, we just new doors on them or different, you know, sometimes we made the doors, sometimes it was Ikea, Ikea doors or, but we reuse those carcasses over and over and over, you know. Um, I just want to uh, move on to the, the next, is that like the, the, the next set of pictures, uh, Jacopo? Yeah, so this, I understand that for Suit Season 5, you acquired sets from the COVID Affairs show and converted them. So I have a two-part question to start off. Is, Clive, did you find this uh, in any way hampered your own creative vision and process? And Joe, can you tell us about how this kind of retrofit affects your job and the ease of or difficulties uh, for construction like when you take on this kind of and these are converted sets, I understand, yeah? Well, the, the, I mean, the, the biggest problem with the COVID sets was um, the, the, a lot, of, well, basically, yeah, the because of the ceiling height in it, it wasn't super high and then there was a grid. And so to really build anything above it. So um, most of the sets that we put, because we had different sound stages, that, you know, we could pick and choose, obviously, but, you know, like this, this one where we have a steakhouse, which is the same space as the Danbury prison, um, you know, we would just redo, you know, all the walls, obviously, but the ceilings was, was always the same height and the same levels inside. So there was, that was that was a problem for that. But um, so, did the, you convert as? But did you convert the design in some way? And was that how was that? Yeah, I mean, it was always um, uh, how do I say this? It was it was you know a time constraint. It was. It was kind of a deal is to convert these things you know so we would have a hospital waiting area and then in the next four or five days later we'd be into a steakhouse and so we had to be really careful about we just pull the walls and put new panels in there and, and are these uh, all the same three sets you know? there's all the same space all the same floor space but not the same and some of the same flats and things like that that's correct yeah but we had you know flats around the, the as we discussed before which were opposed like that steakhouse was um you know they had upholstered flats and, and things like that so we could do it as quickly and you didn't have to have paints and and uh, uh people like that working on these things you know for two three weeks at, at a time it was it was it was instant we had columns wooden columns we changed that you know we had various restaurants in there and we would change that space around we made that steakhouse into maybe four different restaurants by just changing by putting wooden wooden columns in there and just changing the general look of it or Liesl's artwork or we had different bars that we had kind of lying around that we would install and yeah. So by taking on someone like another show's design and other designers work and stuff, you, did, you used it as a leaping off point to kind of create what you Correct. Did for your Correct. Show. Yeah. Correct. And, and Joe, as a construction person, because, you know, I think we've all been through this process a little bit. So, you know, you go look at the COVID sets and then it's like, what, I have to bring all these up? Like, how, how does that, how do you, regard this kind of transition from like reusing material and elements and assets from some other show and, and, and turning it into your own? Well, I, uh, I actually enjoy it. Uh, I know some of my guys might sometimes complain, go, oh, are we, we're doing that again, that set, <laughs> or, you know, we're, we're fiddling around with that because some of them were itching to build something new sometimes. But, but that was mostly temporarily complaining, like everybody would get excited about it. Uh, the advantage is like where it can slow you down is if I have to go like Marion, you got a show that's ending and I got to go send a truck with four guys and load up everything, see what I want, load up and then unload again. But the advantage we had here was all there. So we could literally, uh, and we had a guy, Chris, Chris Allman, one of the guys who worked for it. He knew where all the set pieces were. Like he, he was our guy that found all the little nooks and crannies and we'd say, okay, remember those slats from that? I need those back. I need this. And, uh, I, I enjoy it. It's uh, like, uh, yeah. So the COVID sets had already been disassembled, you're saying? No, no, no. Oh. They had, they were left as is, right, Clive? Okay. Yeah, because it's, because it's, some of the history behind it is because it was a COVID affairs was an NBC show and we shot from suits. We'd gone and borrowed their sets and shot in them. And because we had, we never knew what was coming in the script and we had flashbacks in it. We were never sure whether we would go back to a COVID set or to one of our new sets in the same space. So we were always, we never threw anything away because we were always leery that, you know, one of these scripts we're going to get is going to be a flashback. So now we've got a mass of stuff which we need to reuse and flip around in, in an expedient way. So yeah, it was, um, it was challenging for sure. 
Mary, can I go back to something you said? When Absolutely. You, were, yep. you know, when you asked about like hindering creativity and I keep thinking how maybe as Joe is alluding to uh, that I would be like, oh, we gotta, we're gotta, we gonna do that again. But I do think that there's a point to be made of um, like we're conserving this human energy as well because the time that I already knew there's less work for me to do in one area freed up space for me to be more creative in another area. And even like, you know, we knew this was an older prison, like spend more time looking for that kind of bank seating or, you know, whatever it is. I just think that you have to appreciate that aspect too. And same with the, my team, they might like, you know, we make jokes about flipping sets. We make t-shirts at the end of every year and the words on the set that we always flipped are changed. And I think they would complain about it for a little bit, but they were also coming up with great ideas, things that they had handled so many times, but now they were seeing it differently. Mm -hmm. um, and they had suggestions and, you know, the way we dress things would, would, would grow, you know? So I think that's really important. Well, that's fantastic. Well, yeah, we had a very collaborative team and, you know, and as the designer, I was always really open to having everybody put their two cents worth in there. And, and you know, especially when it came to being green about things. Because when we first started the show, um, NBC really didn't have, a, they kind of had a policy for green, but by the time nine years later, it had become a really big thing. And we were very, very proud and very um, um, involved in doing this. Like it was yeah. a, you know, it was a thing we discussed all the time amongst us. I remember, you know, so. yes, and I remember, Joe, you said that there actually was a sustainability coordinator who helped give you some advisement. So I, this leads me to the next kind of question, which is, is, was there any carbon tracking done or perhaps even a sense of the metrics saved from going to the dump during production and also at the end? Uh, sadly, no. Uh, and, and Shannon Bart was uh, the woman from NBC and she was very helpful and very brilliant. And I didn't, I have no excuse. I did hardly any tracking of this. And I, I kicked myself because I know I did divert a fair bit from landfill. I do know, I did go back and Clive and I, and I figured I saved between construction and paint, you know, I saved at least 32 man days an episode. I've, and that's a conservative amount. Okay. So between that and, uh, and uh, the cost of bin and materials saved that I roughly figure on a, on a slow episode, it was around 14 grand and maybe as much as 20 grand uh, on this. And just while I'm on that subject, uh, two things you need to know about suits that I feel I just want to make sure everybody knows is this actually saved time. Because on suits, I used to joke they were a bit agoraphobic. They didn't like to go out. And at the end of or at the beginning of every episode, they go, oh, yeah, no, we're going to go out for two days, maybe even three. And But it was like Charlie Brown with the football. All of a sudden, they'd get <laughs> down and they'd say, no, no, so we're only going to go out one day. So now we need these sets. And Clive was usually on to them early, like, and say, okay, I think we've got to start looking for these are probably, these are the possible sets that if they don't go out, we'd need. And so sure enough, all of a sudden it was like, sure enough, they'd say, oh no, yeah, we're only going on one day. So you guys need to build this. So we were able to scramble and, and put a lot of that together. And then here's the other thing is they like to use high profile TV actors. And the problem with them is they're going to say, oh yeah, we're going to be here next Wednesday. But then all of a sudden the show they're on, uh, gets set back a few days. So now a set that we've got ready for them, it turns out so often we had a set ready for an actor and then we had to go back to the earlier version because they, their, their um, arrival time got delayed. So there was a lot of that confusion. And I don't think we would have been able to pull it off if we hadn't started thinking more in these terms of modularity. I don't think we would have been able to pull a lot of it off. Right, Clive? That's correct, yeah. Mm. Definitely. And in terms of, um, I just keep thinking of the massive amount of set dressing that was accumulated before my time. And when I came onto suits, it just, we just kept building and we ended up having, I think, six separate little lockups and one was off site. And so we didn't throw anything away. Everything was there, but it was important. We had so many people managing those spaces. So I could always see it because if I don't see it, we're not going to use it. Yeah, that's you know, like, what about those things? Can we use those, you know? And so it, it space was important. So I know that when you're making these considerations, finding the real estate to not throw things out and store this over that period of time. And then in the end, having the largest, one of the largest auctions that that auction house had done. Um, I mean, so many things that I arranged with other shows that are gonna have prisons all went to another show. 
Um, but everything went through the auction, like even the pencils from a hero, like a main character's desk, you know? Um, and I don't think anything, we were around during that auction time. And, you know, when those auctions are done, the rest of it, they'll just offer other people to come in and take stuff. They really try not to put any energy into uh, throwing anything out. So yeah. and that, this is kind of like where, like, I'll, I'll bring this up question up at the end when all the panelists are there, but it, it, I'll bring it up now since you kind of gone into this anyway is like a final wrap that that seems like it's a big bump like you can do lots of uh excellent things while you're shooting to keep things flowing circularly and not throwing things out but that end of end of, end of wrap thing is still a bit of a bump typically is it is it not and was it was it on this show for example i i would agree with you that it is typically but on this show they gave us time to break things down the auctioneer came in walked through all the sets they picked out things that they would be interested in. And so we knew right away. And, and uh, there are some surprising things. I think I've mentioned in another webinar, I was so surprised. I would have thought all this glass, and we had a lot of glass. But of course, it was all tempered and cut to a certain size, which means you cannot recut it. And I would have thought, oh, that's probably going to end up in a dumpster or something. But that glass was some of the first stuff to go. You know, uh, So uh, NBC was very good. Uh, I think they gave us time on wrap everything that didn't go to the auction they actually made some calls and styles to little theater groups and stuff we had people showing up the back door trying to get rid of stuff so it was a very concerted effort on that on that show mm -hmm. that to, to to do it properly and I, and I do have to say because because of by the time nine years have come around and all the sets that we we built out of you know reusing all the stuff they pretty much had come to the, even though we did throw a lot of it out, they, they'd come to the end of its really useful life. Like we we really did extend the life of, of flats that, you know, get warped and reusing it all was always a, a risk. Mm -hmm. you know? But, you know, I think we 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 did a pretty good job, eh, Joe? Like it was. Absolutely, yeah. yes, yeah. Well, especially because like Suits, you have that's what, two years ago now that you guys finished doing that? That's correct, yeah. And so like, it, what's fantastic is that you guys were already doing that you know, for like, you know, maybe five years ago or whatever, and at what point during the nine year trajectory you started implementing some of this flow, but it's fantastic. And just imagine if you were doing it now, just the extra strategy probably. I think it helped because Joe and I always, always had a, a scavenger mentality. That helps a lot. <laughs> I think it helps all of us in this business, to be honest, but, yeah, but yeah. Uh, no, that's, yeah, it's great to hear. So I, I only have a few more minutes with you guys before we have to move on to the endlings people, but so just, uh, have, do you have any other final thoughts about the, the Suits project or maybe other projects uh, that, you know, in, in, in a minute or two, you can just talk about how your strategies have been also been applied? Oh, I, I just want to say it started to go um, a lot better once we made a conscious decision to sort of to go modular like uh, at first it was as clive said scavenging right but once clive liesel and myself really got into uh almost designing to be able to reuse or, or knew that we were going to be reusing stuff things got a lot easier we uh we labeled windows and doors we had exact measurements ready so that uh, the set designers could, they knew exactly. We, we labeled all the windows like D3, D6, doors were labeled. Um, and so it just, so my, I guess my only words of advice is that people can start with this in mind. It's a lot easier. And the ceiling, Clive and I many times cursed at the ceiling because we were dealt the one set that we used, uh, one location there on the set that we used many times. The ceiling was not, never ideal, but uh, it helps. And actually, the, the show I'm going on to now, Adam, I think he may or may not be in this call. Yes, I believe he's in the audience. Oh, yeah. is already uh, designing floating ceilings that uh, like nondescript floating ceilings. And we can then now move around like it's a hospital setting. So we can then. So to start with that is going to be a big plus because now we know we can pull those walls really quickly. And we can change that room from an ICU room to a patient room or to whatever mm -hmm. very quickly. And we, we were forced we had to work into that, but yes. No, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, I, I'm sorry this is such a brief discussion because I think, you know, like there, there's so much more to talk about and ideas that we can we could all share, but this is a, I'm hoping that this is just, again, encouraging your colleagues who are watching out there and will watch this the recording of this later on that um, they'll um, 
you know, we'll, we'll learn some things and, and, and just realize how possible it all is. And it also is great because I think you guys have really, in, in a kind of perhaps loose way, um, underscored the fact that there's a real business case and a, an, an artistic creative case for right. this methodology, you know. And, and I think going forward, there's going to be a whole new, well, there is a whole new generation of filmmakers who will be thinking in this, this way, because we can't afford to keep doing it the way we did it before. So this is, is, is forced on us to change. So yeah. it's, it's a good thing. Yeah. So I'd like to thank you guys for being part of this part of the panel and all the insights and information you've provided to us. Um, and you'll come back uh, in about half an hour uh, with the rest of the, the panel and we'll have some Q&A um, from, from the audience out there. So thank you so much. See you soon. <laughs> Great. Thanks, guys. So uh, if we could just bring on the team endlings. Mm -hmm. So waiting for Louis. Yeah. Is Louis here? No, not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah, okay. I'm coming. Okay, so for, for Team Endlings, we have DGC we production to... designer Ron oh, Stefaniak who is an Emmy award-winning production designer for Hulu's Endlings, as well as a three-time Emmy-nominated production designer for Amazon's Androids and PBS's Odd Squad. Ron is also a special effects designer, a puppet builder, and a puppeteer, whose animatronic creations have appeared in dozens of TV series, movies, and commercials, with his favorite project to date, designing and recreating a 54-foot-long, full-size sperm whale puppet for Amazon's The Boys. And you'll see an image of that later. We have DGC art director Lisa Cohen, and Lisa has worked in the film industry for a decade as a scenic artist and more recently in the DGC as a concept artist, digital sculptor, art director, and first assistant art director. Lisa specializes in unusual projects. Construction coordinator Louis Rodriguez has worked for 25 years in the film and television industry as a NABET member and has been a construction coordinator for the past seven of those years. Louis enjoys the unique challenges of building for film and television and in his free time values time with his family and kids. So the first question I have for you guys, and it's framed slightly differently because your circumstances were a bit different than Suits, is your producer sinking ship won an EMA, Environmental Media Association, Green Seal for Production Award for Sustainability. So what framework was already in place at sinking ship that helped facilitate a process of sustainable circular design build? And Lisa, perhaps you could start being, having been the art director. Sure, thanks, hi. Um, so, it was really a unique experience working with Sinking Ship because they're um, a, a local production company based in Ontario, based in Toronto, and um, they're really committed to being green. So if you could bear with me while I sort of talk about a Venn diagram, not my favorite Venn diagram, which is cheap, fast and good and impossible, but maybe this speaks to that as well. Um, but uh, if you think of three fields intersecting one of them is sinking ship and their policy. Um, one of them is the unique story and vision that we had to work with the script. And then the, the other one is um, Ron and his incredible instinct for salvage and his unique creativity for design uh, in that way. But so, so what I wanna say is to, to talk about sinking ship that they had, they have an award-winning policy for uh, green production and it's all, laid out in a document, which I don't have time to show today, but um, it doesn't really address design, which is what we're talking about, but it addresses, it sets the stage and it addresses the standard that we're trying to achieve, you know, no plastic, carpooling, all of these things, they've uh, got a dozen um, different points. And I think that that was really supportive for our design team um, because it just, names it, it calls it out and it says, this is what we're about, this is what we're going to do. And what a privilege to work with a, a production company like that, with that type yeah. of policy. And, ho and hopefully that becomes a bit of a template for, yes. for many companies. So if we could just show the image of what your, um, um, one uh, collection of images of the spaceship that you made for Endlings. And 
we call this fluid, we kind of call this fluid design. So Ron, looking at this array of images for endlings, can you talk about your process for designing and building this project that also kind of embraced some of those concepts that we showed earlier regarding circular build, like a building for deconstruction and material reuse, recycling, refurbishing, sustainable materials, etc., and avoiding landfill. So if you want to just talk a little bit about your process and all that in making this. Sure. Um, <clears throat> one of the secrets um, to the success we've had with Sinking Ship is their their ability to embrace a, a fluid design process is in the sense that um, as we came up with a basic look for the show and decided what we were going for, it goes all the way back to the, when I first met them on Androids, we were going to create an entire junkyard full of uh, structures and buildings and a lab and all of this equipment. There was so much to create and the budget wasn't as quite as broad as the idea as the as the concept was that we had to really embrace a, a, a hardcore scavenger attitude where we realized we need to find 50% of what we needed. Um, and their ability to allow that design to grow, depending on what we found, depending on the materials, depending on the structures. It, the fun part of the design work is that still trying to keep it cohesive, still trying to keep it all looking like one complete idea. The thing I think I'm most proud of the things we've done at Sinking Ship is with the idea of scavenging so, particularly in the Androids and Odd Squad, scavenging so much a large quantity of items is keeping the, all that look to make it all look like it was purposely built to be together in the first place. Mm. Um, because all of the designs from Endlings and Androids and Odd Squad and Playdate, all these were all very, not so much Playdate, but uh, were all odd spaces, uh, weirdly creative elements, uh, trapdoors, you know, slides, gimmick, a lot of gimmickry, a lot of weird, weird out there design. Um, there was such a broad base of stuff that they had that had to be created, trying to keep the found objects looking like they all had something to do with one another. Turned out to be a great trick. Now that all turned out to be really challenging, but really uh, it was a, a great pleasure to be involved because when we tried to pull it off and it, and it came together cohesively, it was a lot of fun to see it work. And that traveled all the way through by, a, by, by it became our baseline operation for all sinking ship shows that we were doing for them. And the spaceship was one of those occasions where all of that stealing of that, <laughs> that, that stealing the, uh, the annealing of the technique of trying to be really hardcore scavengers while still trying to create a, a cohesive design aesthetic was, it, we came to endlings and we knew the ship was entirely gonna have to be created from scratch. There wasn't gonna be a found practically anything um, because Everything was oddly shaped. It was a double helical design spiraled ship. It, you had to be able to, or there was all the organic sculpture inside and out. But what that did is that focused our energy on everything else in the show, like you know, you, the barn. Yeah, tell us about the barn. I yeah, it, it's a logical choice to say if you're going to build a three ton, 50 foot long spaceship, 16 feet high, that it would probably be better if we were in a studio because we can control the environment. And once again, once you create a 50-foot a, a spaceship or a 50-foot whale, let me tell you, they're not a lot of fun to move <laughs> once they exist. So in the spaceship on top of everything else, not only got moved, but it got moved three times. So making the spaceship modular to go into a, an existing space was a cost-effective solution because we could have created a studio set barn around the spaceship. It would have opened up a whole bunch of uh, flow of work that was a lot faster, a lot more economical, but not to the extent that the cost of fabricating the barn, the cost of fabricating everything around it wasn't really in the cards for us. So, And also Sinking Ship owned the barn or something. Yeah, well, that was the best part because, uh, 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 because they're a local company and they're invested in shows that are being continually back to back and recreated different shows one after the other. The idea of getting buying a property is something that's open to them that may not be open to others that are just coming into town for one show. So they bought the barn, which allowed us to do anything we wanted to it. But when we were in the barn economically, the thing that we could say was we needed, we had to do a shattered section of the barn where the, where the spaceship came in. 
we needed all this barn board and everybody's collecting barn boards for real architecture, for real buildings and real spaces. So even repurposed barn board can be very expensive, but there'd been a huge storm four weeks before we started and three barns had fallen down in the area. So basically the dividend of every shattered piece of wood in the neighborhood came to play on our set. And wow. uh, Louis had to recreate the entire other half of the barn. There weren't stables, there, weren't, there wasn't an upper loft, but he recreated all of the construction on that side of the barn, but the cladding of it and a lot of the detailing and aesthetics on it were found object, were found object of barn boarding that we got for nothing. So let me ask Louis, um, can you talk a little bit about how your process in, in bringing all these found scavenged elements and run and working with Dart Ron, like how, how that affects your process and then on top of it, something like this barn, for example. Well, um, uh, I'd like to say uh, I love working with Ron just for that reason. I think we're both scavengers. We like to bin dive, as you call it, <laughs> and try to get a, as many objects that you can to create whatever we're, we're working with. Uh, I just, uh, in my 25 years of working or longer in the film industry, I've seen a lot of um, things been thrown away. Like, uh, it's amazing the amount of, uh, of, of material that we throw away and that we could actually recycle. I have a pretty big house. Uh, it's pretty well full of all kinds of stuff that, you know, that I can reuse on another show. I just, I'm still uh, just finishing up. Um, um, uh, this show in Niagara Falls uh, called um, uh, Take Note. 50% uh, of the material was other material that I have uh, scavenged from here and there that I give to the production or I give them a deal on it. I mean, I try to recycle as much as as much as I can. It's uh, it's it's it, a good it feel. comes quite naturally to you then, and 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 you actually thrive on it. Sounds like. Yeah, it's it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling when you reuse something and uh, you make something out of stuff that was going to actually be thrown in the bin. You know. Mm -hmm. Just going so, back yeah. to your comment, Ron, where this and, and I've heard you you all mentioned it before that this spaceship. I guess it was built in a shop, was it? And then had to get re getting, why did it have to keep getting moved before it, it was landed? built in two right. shops. <laughs> two shops, yes. <laughs> okay. We started building it in a shop and then uh, halfway through building it, it the, the, the lease what strangely became unavailable <laughs> for the duration of the build. And so we moved it uh, into the studio space uh, over at Buckingham to finish the build over there. Did and you then, know about the barn at this point? Had the barn yeah, we knew we were going into a barn and we were thinking, isn't that fantastic? We won't have to construct the entire barn. And we saw the barn, we said all the bones of it are, are quite beautiful and it's got all the sliding for the light to come in. It's, everything about it seemed to be like it was going to be wonderful. And then we unfortunately found out that the the barn uh, needed quite a bit of structural repair <laughs> before it was, it was safe. Mm -hmm. So the first uh, three weeks of my construction coordinators career on this particular production wasn't spent building spaceships, it was spent re repairing and reinforcing a barn. Mm. Can we go on to the next image, please? It shows another part of uh, your Endling show, and this is the alien nest, I think it was. So mm -hmm. going back to, you, you've already mentioned that you kind of reclaim and reuse a lot of things, and um, can you tell us a bit about how you built this? Because you know, from what you've told me, this was major reclaiming and kind of- Yeah, um, th this, yeah. This, this was, uh, we, Lisa and I, when we read this, the, the script said that, said that that was problematic and this not problematic, but even limited budget resources. We needed to make uh, hundreds of these glass balls that are these orbs that are really singular to the show in terms of all the endlings that the creature is finding, all the last of his species are being put into these orbs and stored in his ship. And when he first arrives, they end up getting ejecting, ejected all over the area and the whole show is about them finding these orbs. Uh, another alien finds the orbs, collects them and builds a nest and is siphoning the energy from them. So we said well, in a nest where there is a hundred spires with a hundred uh, organically sculpted grass, glass and glass and fiber balls inside a large environment where these things are growing out of every orifice in the building, we quoted it out and it was unfortunately uh, triple the cost of what we had to build the set. So uh, we started look, 
looking at locations and we found uh, one of the wrecked barns that one of the wrecked barns that we had scavenged wood from had a sub basement where their roof was already smashed in in two sections and the roof had already been collapsed and things we would have done design wise were prefabricated into the space. We then got there and said uh, the wall was unfortunately not as organic as everything else. It didn't have all the raw, it had beautiful raw timber ceilings and all this wood in the ceiling and above and all, all the structure of the barn was great, but the walls looked like a basement in Mississauga. So we wanted to clad the walls with something. So weirdly enough, somebody had just reclaimed a whole bunch of land outside the barn, outside this barn. And there was like a 40 foot pile of roots and branches and, and natural material from the area. And we cited that this, this alien siphoning this energy had hyperactivated the, uh, had hyperactivated all the organic structure in the area. And we made all the roots look like they had pressed in through the roofing and through the walls and collapsed a section of wall and all of this really elaborate sort of labyrinth like vining was coming through the walls everywhere and by the time it was in and lit and, and the, you know all decorated in there it really looked quite beautiful this was all put in situ then in that barn location you're saying yeah and so uh, quite a sight to see our uh, construction coordinator louis and his amazing people and richard zidner our set, de set decorator who couldn't be here today um the effort and the immediacy and the sort of like it was quite amazing, you know, Ron was standing there pointing and this one there and a little <laughs> higher and they were just like going crazy doing this, um, you know, sort of on-site sculpture with found materials in the moment uh, that we didn't have time to. Uh, so is this a on. set that you mostly moved around outside of and this was kind of a sculpture in the background of sorts? I'm just interested to know it's, how it's, it's, This is the center of the nest, the one piece that we had to construct and framed around the entire outside, all the walls were collapsed with the vining and the branches. Similar, kind of similar texture. Yeah, and then uh, once again, even as something as simple as the fact is, he he was just about to do some construction on the land and had literally jumped a drum, dump truck of sand on the land for something he needed. And he allowed us to use it to, to clad the entire basement of the floor. So, because the floor also was, it didn't have the right look. So yeah, we used his existing sand and the, the branches and everything. That ever, Three quarters of everything on the set was found on the site. Huh. And uh, it saved an enormous amount of money. And then it all went, and then all of the organic material was, of course, you know, sent off to be chipped and, and reutilized. Now, I have to ask this because having, like, we've all shot in sort of organic settings, whether it's on location or something, but since you brought organic elements into a place, what was the bug quotient <laughs> crawling out of this thing? It was not bad, it was cold. It was oh, cold. Yeah, it was in the middle of winter, wasn't it? Oh, basically? really? <laughs> okay. This, we just had to ask. <laughs> so I also know that you uh, acquired elements from some other shows, and include, in fact, suits. So if we could see the image of the um, the, the next two, I forget what the title is. It's called Rescue. Just um, briefly, okay. before we look at this, I wanted to mention... Go back. Do you want to go back to the other picture? We don't need to go back, but I just wanted to say about the, the barn and the farmhouse that because we were able to do our standing sets in this real farmhouse, which is later going to be sold and be a perfectly legitimate house for someone to live in with their family, and the barn will be a perfectly usable barn better than before. But uh, just a little factoid that um, all of the fields, which were also part of the property and a big part of the background in so many of the scenes, were being properly managed in concert with the production company. And, uh, mm. you know, they were able to harvest the corn and then, you know, design wise, oh. we had to go on to do soy in the next season because you have to do that when you're to maintain alternating so, crops. Yeah. yeah, so there was all this sort of background stuff going on that was also quite sustainable. And I will ask before we start talking about this, these next pictures, going back to the barn. Um, I mean, it looked fairly porous. <laughs> it was a lot of nice light coming in, but what did, what happened when it rained? <laughs> Weirdly enough, the, the barn above the floor we were on, that area that the roof was almost intact where we were, mm -hmm. there off to the right-hand side of the barn that was almost like half raised to the ground. It was almost half destroyed. We're, and then the section that just turned out to be really brilliantly useful is in part of the collapse. It collapsed a section of the floor right above where we wanted to work. 
but it it hadn't collapsed the ceiling above it. So uh, it, it was never we never had a weather problem other than uh, the fact that our fog machine, our dry ice machines outside, uh, we would freeze, and then they uh, trying to get them warmed up. Right. Trying to get them warmed up and going with somebody. Somebody had inadvertently turned them off. Of course, they promptly froze outside. So. Right. So this one, this is a, I, I don't know, you can talk about, are, are these two sets in the barn or in a studio somewhere? No, and just, and just, you, rescued, you rescued elements from suits, I understand, and tanning beds and all this kind of stuff. So again, you kind of used the recycling, upcycling, scavenging. Approach. End of the season, no money left, pretty much everything <laughs> here is, uh, yeah. So what were these sets? I mean, just maybe talk about uh, the, the villain had an, an office space that came into the second season where she was going to use one of her holographic television projectors to cover a bunch of stuff that was going on. And they, we just needed a, a simple, a simple, uh, they were looking for something really sterile. So um, we were going to create a structure, but then across the hall, Suits was having that big sale. And one of the things that was up for sale, but was, was uh, didn't, it just was up for grabs was these large louvered vents. And the large louvered vents were, uh, 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 were uh, generously donated, and we worked them into the design of the set just as a as a key point for the background. Mm -hmm. But it was, you know, we decided to slope the roof in, and we decided the fact it'd be an interesting way to light it, and then and got the idea of posting the light around the edge of the room mm -hmm. through the through the chair rails. But it was uh, just a simple simple design, but once again made more interesting when you're. When, when Lisa says we're out of money, you know, we're, we're not talking about a show that didn't have money. They have quite a bit of money and they, they spend a lot of it in CG and they spent quite a lot of it on, on the production design. However, the scale of the show along like a lot of sinking ship shows, uh, you know, JJ Johnson's vision for what he's doing is never ending. He, he's constantly got a bigger, bigger idea. When we did the set for Odd Squad, I, I showed him the design and I said, I think we got carried away. You know, we could scale this down a third and it would still seem quite large because it was 60 feet wide and, and, and 60 feet wide and, and two stories high and 178 feet long. Mm -hmm. And I said, this could be scaled down a bit. And the first thing he did was enlarge the head person's office by double. So he, he actually added things to the show. He added and extended the hallways. He made rooms larger that were smaller. So his uh, vision for what he's doing never shied away from a big idea. The only trick was how to get the big idea for the budgetary envelope we're in, which- I, I think that's a challenge. That, I think that's a challenge that most shows have, regardless of hmm. how you have. So I guess just shifting to the fact that in addition to your daytime Emmy Award for best production design, so that's clearly proof of, um, you know, in a, a creative case for this, uh, maybe if you just talk a little bit more, maybe, you know, all of you could jump in both the business case and, you know, maybe the savings you made both kind of what, in terms of what went to the, the, the dump or cost savings, that kind of thing, just as a general thought on that. I, um, I personally would like to thank Joe and the production from Suits for all the stuff they uh, donated to us, not only those louvers that are there, uh, but the carpet that uh, you guys were talking about earlier, they, they laid down so many feet of it, is part of that set also. And uh, other than that, we built bridges with pieces of two by six that Joe was throwing away. He must have thought of thought I was crazy asking for little pieces of two by six, but uh, we created a bridge to go over the top of a river also with all that stuff that was being thrown away. So I appreciate uh, all the stuff they gave us. But, but and also like, I guess the, the business case is that you able, got a big look for a lot less money than was then. Yeah, it correct. Might have been otherwise. To be honest, um, although, like I said, I think some, some things that saved us a lot of money and went a long way on on endlings are are uh, are true. Uh, a really good example of what we're trying to talk about here, I think, was was the show we did for them before that, which was Odd Squad. And on Odd Squad, when you're talking about repurposed, we're talking about. Uh, I think I think lots of people could obviously repurpose flattage. You get flattages. Of course, you're going to hang on to it. Of course, you can reuse it. 
Uh, and there's always going to be a lot of people that want it. What we were looking for when we did Hot Squad is we found some 50 to 100 uh, odd shaped large structural items that had a great deal of man hours, materials, uh, a lot of love and care put into creating these massive structural, sculptural uh, things, objects that were built, repurposing in them on, on a large scale for such a large Seth Rod Squad turned out to be a lot of fun. Like on Odd Squad alone, there are, um, there's a, there's two eight foot uh, spiral, spiral kid slides, a full size elevator set, 40 airplane truss struts from a, from a B-50, from a, one of the big bombers from Nikita, 30 sheets of perforated metal, per perforated sheet metal, a whole bunch of raw material. Uh, I think 50 scenically constructed beautiful doors, a safe, safe doors, Guantanamo Bay doors, all of these highly scenic doors. We got all these 40 or 50 for this concept in the show where they have all these, this hallway of a hundred doors that all have different purposes. 600 feet of, of wrought iron bridge truss, huge four by four bridge trussing. All, all from some other show. Oh, the four show. So we got the, the top of a grand hotel roofing. We got rolling computer racks, custom constructed lab tables. Uh, fifth, my favorite thing, 40 bombs from Bomb Girls. <laughs> sitting in this huge pile. <laughs> so much. I looked at them and I said, oh my God, that must have been a trial to make all of these circular, you know, long tubular bombs, vacuum forms and seam them and paint them. We took them all, drilled holes in the end, ran them through tubes and they went in our tube room to look like Thunderbird-esque. So let me ask, okay, so t some of this sounds like perfect timing, like, oh, you just came across this stuff as you needed it and, and, and kind of came up with ideas. But then also, Louis, you said that you keep a stockpile of things. So kind of, you know, just, I'm just curious, you know, to think about that. I, I have to start wrapping this part of it up, but I just want you to you know, just comment on that. Like, how do you keep a constant network going with all your different colleagues? In yeah, or? I think it's all, it's all, t a lot of it is timing. Uh, I mean, you, you would have to structure something around it so people are aware of you know, things you've got or they're getting rid of. But a lot of it is just timing, is being at the right place at the right time, doing the, that show and knowing knowing other people that are ending their shows and and and, and, and you know trying to get stuff that they'll they'll give to you you know what i mean once we bring uh, all the panel back i think that's one of the conversations i want to try to open up is just talking about like what you know what kind of solutions so that this becomes a more a less kind of ad hoc process mm -hmm. you know what i mean even though that's part of the fun i understand that and before we move on to the the group panel questions um i just want to segue to another reuse a bit of brilliance you did ron and it's the whale that you created for boy so if you just spend a few minutes telling yeah, us about this. It's, it's not it's not an obvious thought to think when you're asked to build a 50 foot whale do you have anything we could reuse <laughs> um but weirdly enough when they called up originally because we had done the dolphin in season one the dolphin that goes through the window of the goes through the window of the van with the deep uh they said well ron had a dolphin i wonder if he's got any whale parts so they called me up and <laughs> Stefan Steen called up and said yeah weirdly enough any whale parts and weirdly enough I had a whale tail um, but it wasn't the right breed of whale it wasn't the right size but it had a very large mechanical mechanism in the tail that was uh, um, a very not a very high tech very low tech strength amplifier that was done in linkages that when you pushed on the end of it you could you could get four times the push on making the tail move. Um, it amplified the strength of the person moving it as it went down the line. It was just linkage based steel and it went down. And when we took that and it, uh, Louis took that, reinforced it, uh, reinforced it, made it much stronger. Uh, but once again, that massive tail on the whale, which I think is 18 feet long, is being operated by a single person inside. It mm -hmm. isn't hydraulics. There were actually seven puppeteers inside the whale. On, on a very hot day. On a very <laughs> hot day, covered in blood, moving, moving it manually. But an example of that is they came to us originally asking for potentially a static built whale prop. And I didn't offer it up. 
arbitrarily or lightly when I said, well, you know, wouldn't it be great if it could move? I said it could be in its death throes. The tail could be still slapping the ground, the mouth could open up, the fin could be still moving in one last heave and die. I could offer up that because I'd hung on to this crazy mechanism in the tail. And I knew that was already time and money saved while it was coming out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. um, case in point, even this, this styrofoam that was carved, it wasn't the styrofoam sculpture that was made, uh, once again, because of budget and timing, it wasn't milled on a, from a computer model on a CNC machine. It was all hand cut and handmade chainsaws and sculpting tools by a very talented uh, group of sculptors working for me. My core member of my crew uh, uh, were all making this thing with literally their hands. But in doing that, the, the, uh, the styrofoam wasn't turned to dust when we made it. There was huge offcuts. All that raw offcut styrofoam went, half of it went to another show that was making wreckage from a collapsed building. And I'm really proud of this. The other half of it was, was surrounded by half naked people in a caravana parade where they did a, whole, did a whole winter display with all of the excess styrofoam they were doing off and then turned into caravana floats. And I think, I mean, that's, that, that's so fantastic that all so much got used. I mean, I do, I think there is still the bump uh, kind of concern here all, overall in the industry, but, including for this. But I think, that, you know, just that's, this is just fantastic examples of how to, to keep reusing and, and keeping things in the flow and, and staying on your toes in terms of thinking about how to reuse things as well. So, of course, I have to wrap up the endlings part of the panel and bring the, um, I want to thank you very much for, for you know, all the information and insight you gave us here. And I welcome back the rest of the panel and we'll hopefully have some questions from the floor, but I just have one or two to get started. Is everyone back yet or everyone's still coming back? Eh? Everyone's still coming back. Thank you, Joe. So just, uh, Joe, you can probably hear me. So I'll just start get the ball rolling of questions. Is just thinking about wrap and is this perhaps the biggest roadblock to embrace the circular design flow? Like, is there a real wrap bump? And if there is, um, you know, what kind of thoughts do you have to maybe move to the next stage of sustainable, in, you know, design build, circular design build? Yes, there is uh, a problem at wrap because often it's, uh, you know, they're in a hurry to get out of the studio or, or to end that contract or another show's already contracted to come in. Uh, and I think the, I think what we need to start doing is starting to think as we are approaching wrap of whether it be an online process or an actual physical building of starting to to let other people know what we have and what's going to become available. So I think that's on us to, to start earlier because we know what we have. Um, and uh, I think it would be so helpful to have some kind of a central, and I know Marion, you're working on this and, and Ontario Green Screen I think is too, some type of a share thing that we can uh, grab these pieces from each other. I'm actually in conversations with uh, uh, Chucky right now uh, I'm not sure what they have that we can use, but uh, but in terms of uh, because I'm about to start a new show, so I'm more, and they're wrapping down, but it's just we just need more of that. We need more. We, I, th I think there needs to be uh, an open space or a, a, whether it be physical or online that we can go to and look and see what each other has. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have thoughts on that before we go to the floor with questions? Yeah, Lisa. Um, I can also speak to that as from a background as a scenic. Um, it's sort of like the ugly secret at the end of the show and, and the times that I've been present for rap, um, the amount of paint or Ron's got a terrible story about AB foam, which is an environmental catastrophe. Um, just the things that get thrown out just because it has to happen in about 30 seconds and it's just got to be. Um, but uh, a lot of our DGC members are not um, present to witness that. And uh, I always thought it would be amazing to have um, like a eco supervisor present at RAP, you know? Hopefully that'll become more, more prominent 
I, I just think it, it that would be fantastic but I think every situation I've been in it has to start from the top so the producers have to be involved right. from the beginning um, knowing that this is the way it works and I have used a, a tracker like like my own tracker to let other people know what we have and ask for permission right. for that yeah, so I think it's just yeah and getting permission to do that because they're like oh that's a great idea you know and it was the right mm. producer and you know but something like that yeah um I mean, again, this is just a real short uh, touch on this subject, but I want to make sure that any questions from the floor get addressed too. But I just wanted to break this that that uh, consideration out there that wrap. You know, if there are some ideas of how to maybe solve you know, the wrap issue, the wrap bump. So, are there questions from the floor? Um, uh, I think it's Naomi. Are you the one that's offering those up, or are there any questions? Hi. Yes. Um, this is Naomi. So we do have a question in the chat from Donna Noonan, and this is a question regarding suits. So Donna was asking, would you need to get copyright clearance for the fabrics? Yeah, I did mention that, like, I've done it twice where I've had to do it because I knew, you know, it was recognizably uh, a Mary Meko fabric, uh, or, or that's what it looked like. And then I discovered I could do some research and that is what it was. So we got that cleared before we used it on Covert Affairs. And I can't remember the other one we used, but it, it just felt very recognizable. And, you know, I had the buyer do some research and then we managed to get it cleared. Excellent, thank you. So I'm just going through our question and answer right now. So um, for audience members, just feel free to uh, drop a question into the Q&A function. So we're gonna start with a question from David Harvey. And this is another question for the suits team. Um, David says, I've just learned that some slash all of the suits and Chucky's backdrops are being sold off. How can we keep these invaluable resources? Could IATSE or the DGC purchase them, uh, purchase them to keep them out of the landfill and perhaps create a new revenue source? So for anyone on the suits team, uh, feel free to take it. Well, I, I think the, the, the big problem is with all these backdrops. No, number one is that they, they were some of the biggest, they were huge and um, very specific for the certain uh, floor that, the, that this uh, office tower in New York was based on. So, so you've got that to deal with. Um, so, it, I mean, it's all, as a production designer, it's always your worst nightmare is that, you know, is getting these backings and getting them in time. And, you know, so yeah, we're always hunting for who's got what in town and, you know, we're, we're renting them from LA and pay, paying a fortune for them all. And so I'm surprised that, that uh, someone hasn't, you know, started a company in, in here. And I mean, there are companies in LA, but- uh, Wiseacre, yeah. Wiseacre has started having- Are they? Backdrop stash, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, an answer to Dave, yeah, check out with Pete Miskimmon at Wiseacre because he might take them on. He's got a bunch of backdrops. So, um, yeah. Um, there, I see another question. Naomi, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, actually, we just have a comment from Amelia Brook. And she says, uh, just a comment, agreed, a community board where material can be offered up is essential, preferably not on Facebook. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I don't know if any I'll, I'll just, even though that was just a comment, it may well be Facebook as, a, as the immediate term because we, there has been conversations about this and it just seemed like there's various kind of uh, share information share Facebook groups now and it just seems like that might be the most immediate solution until another platform could be created but you know something that's specifically geared towards material uh, asset sharing for a closed group of people in the industry so anyway that's in the works but nothing has been created yet but yes absolutely some kind of share share board is, is, is would be ideal yeah. excellent thank you okay on to our next question from Marina Ord this is incredible to hear because this is exactly what our company, Digital Canaries, does. We just assisted with the wrap slash set striking for two shows in which our team came back into breakdown sets and take the materials to reuse for future sets and set pieces. From your perspective, what's the most important consideration for a team like ours coming in to assist with a wrap? 
Thus far, it seems like making the materials unrecognizable for future shoots has been a major concern. So I think either um, team or show can answer this one. Well, well for, for me, I think one of the biggest concerns of recycling things, um, especially at the end of a show, is, is, um, is keeping the things in, in, in good working order or, or looking, you know, new or whatever, you know, like, a lot of times things when they're taken apart are just trashed or they're, they're so you know wrecked that they're, they are literally unusable um, because the mindset is that okay it's all going in the dump so that needs to change um, and it costs money to do that you know obviously to take you know set pieces apart and keep them and wrap them properly you know protect them and do all that stuff that's a big concern and it and it's it's uh yeah it's going to take a big seismic shift to change that whole ideal in people's minds yeah, at the core of it is it's the ex the, the expedience is that we got it's got to come down that day and it's got to go away quickly, and if we're managed to be timing wise, we're standing in the right place at the right time. We've gotten the advantage that we're always what we're usually after are, are the more the, the bigger pieces, the giant things that nobody's going to take away easily or quickly, and a, a really simple example of how it doesn't have to worry about being reused in the same way is. We, uh, from Nikita, they had a truck mounted ICBM missile and the giant cradles that held the ICBM missile, uh, which had all this beautiful metalwork on big bolts and just massive looking structure. We turned them aside and they became the kitchen tables inside Odd Squad. They turned them into infinity tables with mirrors in them, but they had this beautiful look and structure to them that also just happened to look like one of the icons of the departments in Odd Squad where one of the icons was a light bulb. And so it tied into what we were doing aesthetically, but at the same time, this massive piece wasn't gonna to be too useful to anybody. But when you, when you walk into a set being taken down and see all of this stuff around, I don't think there's a designer or, or a set dresser around that when they look and see the stuff on the floor that see massive, weird, interesting shapes, it lights up your imagination. There's yeah, it sparks of, imagination. Yeah. It pretty much encourages you to say, I wonder what I could do with that. Mm -hmm. And so quite simply, we can't all be there at the wrap at that moment. I think the visual networking is everything. It's the mm -hmm. ability to see before the set comes down that they go, these giant elements potentially, because uh, they have such an oddball use. They, like, I, they will always find a use for the flat, but but the large structural, interesting sculptural piece, so many of those things could be turned into something else. And obviously they'd be totally repurposed or, re or a different look. I think it just uh, segueing back to Marina's question and also going back to something, Joe, you and I talked about in conversation, because I, I see all this as part of the same thought really, is the business case for making a better wrap. Like, because I remember you talked about like, yeah, there's, there's savings to be made if elements can be, not just thrown in the bin because there's bin cost like tipping costs are, are huge mm -hmm. so what can what can be um salvaged by you know getting a waste company to come in and you've already got pre-harvested goods so that you know th there's a win-win situation in that way and also going back to what marina questioned about making materials unrecognizable so are you deconstruct do you think can deconstructing sets so they actually become elements of metal glass wood flats and stuff is a thing or trying to kind of create um, wholesale, this is a set and it's going out and you can reassemble it, but you have to change the paint color or whatever. So all of this kind of gets into the same conversation and just, just some thoughts from all of you guys. I, if I could just say along that same line too, I think, no, I'm, not, I'm saying this, I'm not a designer, but I think we need to get over this uh, recognizable thing. Like Ron said, you walk in, those were iconic pieces, but because he used them in a different context, and that's, I think no designer is going to want to use it exactly the same. So I, I, I'm not in favor of breaking it down. I think if there's some nice architectural pieces, they should go as such. And I think any designer is going to try and, like you say, at least repaint, but, uh, but using it in a different context, I don't think anyone's going to notice that. Hey, I think I saw that in the third episode of Suits. Uh, I mean, there, there might be a few, somebody out there that would, but not enough, not enough to, to worry anybody, in my opinion. And I can uh, kind of I, see the question. Sorry, do you have a comment, Louise? Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, we're going to get to the point where we're going to have to keep a, a track of what our carbon footprint is for doing all of this. 
and keeping a, an itinerary of, of all the items which we use and recycle and and there will be a credit for a production company because they've actually you know done this you know they've, they've saved this this and this and this and i think that's kind of well, it, it was happening on on uh, nbc on suits at the end but i think i think you're is, right uh, what's that i think you're absolutely right that yeah and, and that's going to be for everybody people designing people building people painting for every single department that uh, you know there's a cost for doing all of all of us okay. you know um, so, I can just, just kind of on the tails of this, I, uh, Naomi, excuse me, but I can, can you see the next question, which kind of leads into a little bit of um, what was talking about in terms of the sets as they are. Do you wanna, do you wanna read that out for everyone? Yes, definitely. So we have our next question from Jackie Hemingway asking, have you experienced proprietary issues with using sets from other shows? And if so, how do you deal with it? So I think this is for both teams to weigh in on. Well, I I, I think, you know, if we, we're going to take sets from other shows, I mean, as a production designer, you're never going to have someone else's, you're never going to put someone else's set on, on a different show. You're going to make it different, right? You know, that's, that's being a designer and being clever about what you do. And if you're forced into using recycled material, um, you just, you know, design it in a way that, that it, you know, it looks different or it is different or you've hidden those elements which make it so recognizable because most production companies yeah you're correct they don't want you using their set you know on another show like it's just it's 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 pretty basic perhaps this will change too perhaps this will be one of those earlier conversations that will become the norm where you, you know producers and designers and construction people weigh in together and go what is the what it what is our position on this and planning again going back to those points of circular like planning for the end at the beginning if you know what i mean right. like what's going to happen to all the stuff at the end so that could be part of that conversation Ryan, can i go back to what you were saying because i'm really interested in knowing um more about you know a company that's going to come in and work with us because i'm there all through rap to the bitter end but also maybe working with the auction houses which are becoming a better way mostly because of COVID first, I think, but having an online sale rather than people coming in for a set sale. Because right now, guys, for auction 416, there's some good materials there that you should look at. Uh, I think it's on for the next five days. But I think Ron made a comment about, you know, you see 57 of something and you start to think there's some multiple of things on that auction and things are going really cheap right now. But um, I think maybe it's, it's, it's more of a community that works together and producers and productions are aware that you know safely people are coming in while things are being deconstructed safely people are coming in to set up an auction because you know and and that information is going out to all productions um you know that kind of thing uh, no absolutely i think that's all part of it but I, I think more about the proprietary thing or if a producer says hey you can't sell my stuff i think that's where the earlier conversation might help alleviate any concerns or but I think that's one of the keys is that I, I don't think when I, when I think of it, I think of it the way that we've, I've done it really for 25 years is it seldom is about buying it. So it's more along, it's more along the pay it forward is what's really going on. A bigger production is helping out a production that it doesn't have financial resources, but the stuff is sort of passed along and then it can be passed along again. It can be passed along again. But because like I said, at the, at the, everybody has said that at the core I don't think anybody wants to bring the same design and just transfer it over. It's the most interesting part is how you reuse it. But it goes back to what was the key thing that was said is it comes from the top. So isn't really the solution that A, that these things are passed along and that potentially they don't have a cost value where the cost comes into it is in an incentive based program where the people that have spent all the money making all this have a good incentive for showing a green a green footprint because that people are really looking for that and there's so many other incentive programs in Ontario for the film business that have drawn huge production to the city this is just one other aspect and there's no question that if it was passed along inexpensively or for free uh, then the chances of it being reused is almost 100 percent and if the problem isn't that it's it's an aesthetic copy, that it's just the raw material or something being reused in a different way. It being moved along, the incentive completely, the financial incentive could be 
any, like I said, is in what you said. I, be I believe incentives like that actually are already in the conversation. So don't be surprised if you start seeing something like that enter into the into, into the actual industry. Because I think, yeah, once that happens, I, I think the, the ability to set up a network, or like you said, a visual auction, which is sometimes even less on auction is that help this not end up in the trash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, like I said, you see the oddest things, but if you see a collection of them or see really inter something interesting sculptural. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it, I think it excites designers when they find that stuff. There's another question, uh, Naomi. One, I wanted to say one quick thing. Uh, not uh, not everything has to be recycled within the movie industry. I think I think there's so many other avenues like uh, escape games, theater theaters, and uh, you know other groups that would take take stuff to use not only film. I mean I think there's a much broader uh, av avenue there. And I think that you 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 both of you guys are correct. It's, even if we have to give it away for free. Producers yeah. don't like to give stuff away, but yeah, if you can just, rather than it going in the dumpster and someone can use it, school or some theater or whatever, correct, correct. give it away. Just, I'll you know, just mention have. that um, in, in, the, in the chat links, there's a thing to keep it green recycling. And there, it's not exactly the model we're talking about, but they actually have, a, they're kind of more a waste um, organizing facility, but they actually have a thing that if you bring a, a five ton uh, to them for $599, you can dump it off and then it's free to whoever wants to come and get it. So there's different models that people are adopting. So you can check out Keep It Green Recycling just to see what they have. Um, you know, so I think that it's definitely so much in the conversation of trying to remedy, you know. Because there's, there's only one other little intercept step that that's, needs to happen. And if things were photographed before it, that the set came down. Absolutely. Because the key to it, the key to it is, is when they take it down, I get it. The expedient thing is to tear it down. But had that visual auction happened or a visual community had gotten a hold of things, then there's a reason to keep something intact. And, and you're not slowing down the overall process. You're only keeping intact things that are gonna have that second life. Mm -hmm. um, Naomi, I think the, the next question sort of seems like it um, might be tying into this too. Should I read it? Uh, yes, uh, Michelle's question or Salma's question? Salma, Salma's. Well, both, both of them really, but Salma's. Yeah, things, okay, yeah. so we'll start with uh, Salma's question and then move on to Michelle's. So first we have, um, I'm wondering if there are currently any inventories of the pieces available, even on the show level, so that um, the productions can keep track of the existing pieces that can, that can become the foundation for a more formal exchange platform. So that kind of speaks to what you were talking about, Ron, is like having good pictures of the assets and the elements. So I think that's something else. That, we're tracking them anyways, right? Yeah, so I think that's a good good point that maybe not right now in answer to someone else's question, but ideally the strategy moving forward, it, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good one. And uh, Naomi, I see Michelle's question, which I think is also quite good, goes back to something that to Louis and Ron were saying. Yes, so Michelle is asking, um, I work in accounting. This may have been covered at the beginning, but are there sustainability tax credit incentives in place or being considered at the provincial or federal level? So I, can, I can't say anything officially, but yes, that is happening. <laughs> that, that, is, that is in the works uh, between the DGC uh, at the DGC national level. Can I, I hope I can say that, uh, Natalie Ann, <laughs> without being too, uh, hmm. too uh, much more. But yes, that, that is definitely in the works. Um, so just, I mean, I, unfortunately, we're, we're already a bit over time, but this is fantastic. I didn't want to cut things off. Uh, I, do you guys have any parting thoughts about um, suggestions or recommendations or anything like that that um, you, want to, you want to tell tell to the audience out there before we have to close I up? I have to say something. You have to shout it from the mountaintops. You just got to talk to each other. You got to tell people all the time. Just keep talking about it. Just keep talking about it. Yeah. Get, get committed. Everybody yeah. get committed with this because it's the future. You know, it's, uh, we can't go on the way we've been going on. So get yeah. committed. I agree um, with what I've said is just a, it, it, the problem is a, it's a primal shift in attitude and society. <laughs> a, we actually have to change the way people think because 
we've been doing doing it one way forever, and it's going to be really hard to get people to change. That's not. It's. I don't think it's. I don't think it's in people's nature when. It is, but I think actually you guys have been uh, been real no, ray of optimism and possibility, and I think a lot of our colleagues out there are probably doing more than they realize, and and there's just that that they just have to take it to a, a more conscientious phase. I think that's, that's my feeling. It's, 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 people are always wondering. Sorry, people are always wondering what they can do and and think they're not going to make a change. But here's an opportunity. We're part of such a big community. We can make a huge change because we're you know you know that. People can't make it individually on their own. So it's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. Just like recognizing that these things have value, even if there's something that's already been happening, there's a, a shift in the awareness that we can have together as a union, as a community, uh, as a couple of unions together to say, no, wait a minute, this thing that we're doing is valuable in another way. And uh, I think it's nice that it also kind of leans in the direction of collaboration, boots on the ground, walking through together, figuring out, you know, how we can use this stuff, reaching out to our friends on social media. Hey, I've got this cool thing. Like, I like the community connection aspect of it and the aspect of reclaiming something that maybe a lot of people on this call are already doing, but, you know, we can um, recognize the value of it. It's a great aspect. start to a big problem. Joe, do you have any parting comments? Uh, no, I think I think everything's been said. I just think the it's just good uh, that we're talking. It's, it's good, and uh, I think we all need to start to pressure our producers in terms of uh, of this. Uh, you know, individually, if they just keep hearing it, and then I think the first thing I'm going to do Monday on my new job is find out who the the um, sustainability officer is because I believe there is, and then you got them on board too. So that's one thing to help, I think. Yeah, and uh, and uh, everybody, just uh, keep your eyes peeled because there will be, you know, there are uh, uh, various initiatives in place, including you know the um, the tax credit possibility. There's also the idea of this shared platform, so that it becomes even easier to share your assets and and material information. And, um, and and possibly you know, expansions of some kinds of uh, sustainable lockups where elements can go when they're in that kind of stage between once being used and before they transition transition to something else. So you know these are all strategies that are definitely being talked about, and hopefully we'll we'll start seeing in the next uh, within the next 12, 12 months anyway. So um, unfortunately, we do have to wrap this up. I, it's a, it's a gorgeous, sunny Saturday afternoon here in Toronto. And, and for those of you that aren't in Toronto, I hope you have a sunny day that you can get out to now. But I really appreciate you being here for this time. And um, a, a special thanks to the six panelists for all your time and energy in this. I know that we had, we had a lot of conversations before it and put, we put a lot of thought and work into it, as did Natalie Ambrosard and John McNeil and a Jacopo in the, in the back room and Gustavo and Naomi and, and all the DGC staff who really helped put this thing together. There's a whole machine behind the, the screens here. So I really want to thank all of you. And uh, hopefully there'll be some other kind of webinars that also I give information. But again, check the chat out because there's lots of information there for you. And again, we're just really striving to normalize effective sustainable actions within our industry. So do what you can. and. Um, and a reminder that this has been recorded today and at some point in the future, I don't know if it'll be in the next few months or what, but it will be available as kind of a podcast or recordings for, for you to review or to offer up to your colleagues to see as well. So, um, yeah, so I think that's it for now. And uh, again, thank you so much for being here.